welcome to Rational Investing. My name is Cameron Stewart, CFA. Thank you very much for watching the channel, all the comments and subscribers. I greatly appreciate it. This channel, we're dedicated to the rational investor. We are hunting for value stocks that we believe we can buy uh, below their intrinsic value, hold them for a long time, and realize an increase in outsized, uh, above market, whatever you want to call it, uh, return. We do that with the five key attributes. We look for top line revenue growth. We look for earnings growth. We look for strong free cash flow, low debt, and a uh, well-priced security. That's what we've been doing here at the channel for almost a year. But I wanted to take a minute and recap a little bit about the year. Uh, from what I'm seeing in the market, I see a market that is uh, has fully recovered, at least the stock price has fully recovered, if not gone above where I thought it would be um, this time this year. And I'm having a harder time finding good value at reasonable prices on all the large cap companies that I'm finding, that I'm searching for. So I think what we're going to do is we're going to pivot. And in 2021, uh, at least we're going to attempt this, we'll see how far I can go with it, but I want to start looking down market. Not the big cap companies, not the mid caps, start looking at small caps, let's go micro cap, let's, let's mix it up and find companies that have no analyst coverage, that are not on an index. Uh, that are not receiving zombie money from the, the index, the passive money that, that's out there. We want to find companies that are, that are well operated, that are young, that, are, that have large management stakes in them, uh, but still meet our criteria, right? Top line revenue growth, earnings growth, low debt, well priced, and uh, strong free cash flow. That's, that's what we want to try to do. And I think if we can pour through some of this, maybe come up, come up with a couple gems, that will really grow as they get included in these indexes, as an analysts uh, find them and, 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 um, and begin to start coverage of these companies, and they get greater, greater exposure, more capital will be drawn to them, and they should have a nice run up in price. Let's start taking a look. Um, this is uh, you know my first attempt. We're going to try with this company behind me. Uh, let me know what you think, and I'll look forward to the comments. All right, here we go. The company behind me is Fever Tree. Now, Fever Tree makes mixed uh, cocktail mi cocktail mixers that go into your whiskey, your gin, your vodka to spice up the drink a little bit. They talk about the quality of the mix that they make, and they tout that they are the UK's number one provider of mix uh, cocktail mixes. Now. This information, uh, because they're a pink sheet stock, they don't have to file like every other public company that we have looked at on this channel. Uh, there are different requirements that the SEC asks of pink sheet companies, and uh, this stock is, 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 is no, no different. So what I've had to do is actually go to the London Exchange, pull down the materials that I can find from the London Exchange, and, 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 and go to the company's website and pull down materials that they have. So please, do your own research, smell check all of these numbers. I don't believe anything in here is audited that I could find. So there's a little bit of a wing and a prayer on assuming some of these numbers are correct. Uh, I've done what I can do from what I can find, but I wanna definitely uh, flag that for you that this is their information or it's information that I can't verify has been audited. Here we go. Let's take a look. This is their 2019 annual report. It says preliminary results. I don't know why I pulled it down. It's the most recent document they have on an annual basis. So it should be the final version. But let's go through it. Um, there's a nice little COVID update here that they gave uh, that one thing I wanted to show you is they had strong free cash flow, no debt, and a large cash balance of 120 million pounds. We get, remember British company, all this is pounds. Uh, going kind of into uh, the UK, uh, the UK um, uh, COVID crisis, they're about 50/50 wholesale retail on their business across the across the different uh, domestic uh, excuse me different paths uh, distribution channels. Do predominantly UK, so if I go down to their financial stack here, uh, 2019 full year revenue. This is millions pounds, 260 million pounds. So still, even though this is a pink sheet dot in the United States, they're still selling their products and generating 260 million pounds of revenue, which is a lot of revenue. Uh, most of that is in the UK. So um, 132 million pounds in the UK. Here's the rest of the world broken down by category. And you can see the US is relatively small, but year over year growth in the US is tremendous at 33%. Top line revenue growth for, excuse me, the UK rather was flat year over year, which is not what we want to see. Um, 
I dug into it a little bit. They were saying that the Christmas market in 2019 was a little weak in uh, in the UK. I don't know. I tried to look at UK GDP. I didn't see a blip. I'm not sure what they're talking about. If anybody knows what's going on in the UK Christmas time last year, put down in the comments, let us know. They said that they had a banner 2018 year and then 2019 with a little soft Christmas became in weak to produce this flat line. But they're seeing strong revenue growth in all the other global markets uh, and, and they just entered the US. So that, that's their story. They, they have said it's under their expectations of their level of performance and that they expect to do better. Let's keep going down. They publish an EBITDA number, which I really wanted to talk about. 77 million pounds on 260 million pounds is a 30% EBITDA margin, which is very strong. And I want to sense, I want to, I was a lot, I was shocked by how big that was. And I'll get to why in a second, but it's really nice to see. It seems like it's consistent. I'll show you greater historical information in a second, but I wanted to call that out. Um, other things, this breaks down the UK. Uh, U.S. market grew 33% over that period of time. Here we go. U.S. Basically, 2018, they were kind of feeling out the market. They believed that they wanted to enter it. 2019, they're building teams. They're doing pricing study. They're to begin launching into 2020. Uh, and you can see now they're in Target and Walmart, uh, and they're starting to grow in, uh, in the U.S. in uh, 2020 and beyond. But uh, that's... The, the big difference in growth in 2019 was that they just started in 2018, basically had a stand-up team. Some other information just round out. They had a pricing study in 19 to fit in the U.S. to figure out where they should price their products. They believe with this new pricing adjustment that they have made, they will gain traction. Uh, this is some of the other material. Europe grew 16% year over year. Uh, rest of the word, 32% year over year. Summary here, business model. This is what... I was surprised by and I liked. They've outsourced their production. So they are very asset light. So when on uh, this channel, we have talked about the difference between EBITDA and EBIT. EBIT, right, does expenses to depreciation of capital investment, which in a light business model, you've outsourced your manufacturing. You don't have to build the factories. You don't have to build the production line. You don't have to maintain operating efficiency. You're paying someone else to do that. And that asset light model means that depreciation amortization is, is really low. So your EBITDA is going to be close to EBIT in this scenario. And that's why their EBITDA margin is so high. Uh, but I do like that a lot. It was really neat to see. Uh, and it was something that I wanted to explore. Uh, that's their, that's their uh, slogan. Th uh, if, if three quarters of your drink is in the mixer, uh, mix with the best. So I kind of like that, actually. All right, I want to talk about this chart. This chart I downloaded directly from their website, and it's a chart of the top shareholders. Charlie Rolls and Tim Warlow are the two founders of this business, and they maintain a sizable portion of the equity ownership in the company to this day, 7% and 5%, excuse me, 7% and 4.7% respectively, which might be a single digit on the equity number, but the business itself is a $3 billion market cap, which means that this 5% is roughly 150 a million dollars of, uh, of of equity value that's sitting in this business. So he is, has all kinds of incentive to grow that and to maintain and safeguard it. So that's, that's a neat value check. The next thing I want to do is I want to look at year-to-date 2020 numbers to see what they've done, what the impact of COVID has been, and then I'll have a smell check where the full year numbers will come in. Okay, behind me is the most recent data I could find for the first half of 2020. And let's take a look and see what happened. The first half of 2020 revenue, 48 million pounds in the, in the UK, 27 in the US, 20 in Europe, rest of the world eight for a total 104. Um, that's down 11% year over year. It's neat to see that the US continues to grow at 40%, which is strong growth. Again, they basically just stood up a business in 19. So going from almost nothing to uh, to a, to a full-fledged business being at Target, Walmart, is the reason for this monster growth. But it also means that they're investing in this area heavily, and I think that's where they believe they can grow, that this U.S. market will be materially larger than the U.K. market over time. But it looks like 11% drop in revenue. EBITDA, they still published EBITDA at a margin of 22%, but it's down 35% year-over-year 
uh, when we look at the first half of 2020. So this is kind of what we're going to use when we when we publish our estimate of what full year 2020 will look like. And then kind of re going forward, we do expect them to turn the business around. Uh, I was pleasantly surprised when I saw these numbers, by the way. Uh, really, really strong uh, growth number. So I have, what I've done is I've converted all of these into USD to make uh, it easier for me to understand. I'm taking the average exchange rate each year for cash flow and income statement numbers, and I'm taking the December average ending number, the average month, December value exchange rate, and applying that to balance sheet numbers to get these, to get these financials. 2011, $19 million of revenue, uh, and have grown that to 30, Three, $333 million of revenue in 2019. Uh, that's tremendous growth. That's a 43% annualized growth rate. And it's extremely strong every single year, 19, 25, 40, 58, 90. It, it, it's very, very nice. Stumbles here, right? We covered this. The stumble in the U UK, um, we're going to give them credit. They acknowledge that it underperform their expectations a 10% year over year increase in the UK in pounds 10% and they said that is below their management expectations and they expect to correct it but strong track record I would think they'd be able to revert that higher EBITDA EBITDA followed the same trend so five million dollars to 96 million dollars over this period of time that's a 45% annual growth rate with strong margin this margin is 32% pretty consistently every year and part of that outsourced model that they have. And I, I like that. Here's the growth rate of revenue. I just did toss that off to the side. Absolutely monstrous every year with the exception of the last year. So I, I'm hoping that they'll get somewhere close to this in the outer years in the future once, once COVID recovers. But that's earning, this can be, that's revenue, that's EBITDA. Let's take a look at enterprise value. Debt, like they said in the document, is, is zero. This is effectively zero. Um, less cash, there's no excess cash, even though they had a strong cash balance. I'm leaving all the cash in the business. I want them to use it to grow. I'm not gonna remove that from enterprise value. Market cap, market cap has been fairly flat. This is shares outstanding times average price for the, for the December fiscal year end, $1.5 billion to $3.6 billion. Seems like it spiked up and it has remained flat for a long time despite a very heavy, excuse me, very high growth rate in earnings, which is which is neat to see. I think this here maybe the 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 market got a little ahead of itself, buying in. Uh, it's 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 come flat for a little while, but earnings have continued to grow, which is nice to see. So that means enterprise value is the same as market cap, um, and then EBITDA. What I was just talking about, EBITDA value, excuse me, the, the our, our pricing metric, EBIT uh, enterprise value is EBITDA. Fifty five times. 67 times. That's the kind of the high water mark when it spikes to $3 billion of value, but the EBITDA is still small. EBITDA grows, market cap stays the same, so this, this metric falls, and you see it 38 times by the end of, of 2018, excuse me, 2019. Currently, it spiked back up. I think that's the, a combination of, well, this, this is forward EBITDA, so this is 2020 estimate of EBITDA, which is lower than this number. So you have a higher multiple. It's currently at 64 times in my opinion. But we don't know if that's well priced or not. It's it's definitely a taller number that we are used to seeing, but these are smaller companies. Uh, it has been growing with uh, quite the gusto. So maybe it deserves it. Who knows? Let's, let's, let's see. Let's go through cash flow and see if any of this EBITDA is landing in the, uh, in the cash flow statement. And uh, absolutely. So Cash flow from operations two million dollars to eighty-seven million dollars in twenty nineteen. That's a sixty percent annualized growth rate, which 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 dovetails nicely with the fifty-four percent growth rate that we saw in EBITDA. So this this EBITDA is translated to cash, which is nice. I'm glad this number is positive. It's it's nice to see a young company that is growing and producing cash. That is something we want to see. CapEx is almost nil. Again, that's reflecting the asset light model that they have. They don't have to buy, uh, they don't have to build factories. They don't have to build bottling factories and production plants, pipelines. They basically 
uh, update laptops for people in the design room and that's all you got. Uh, debt payment zero. So all of this cash flow, which is very similar to the EBITDA, which is very strong at 20, 30% of revenue, flows straight to cash flow, free cash flow earned. That's, that's impressive. Um, free cash flow earnings and then shares. Very interesting here. Shares are flat. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm pulling this data. This is, this is, this, I get this data as a direct feed from the S and P. Uh, I'm surprised to see this. I double checked that number. That 116 is right. They are not issuing shares uh, and they are producing cash, which is an amazing, amazing hallmark for uh, how, how much respect for the equity holder this company has, uh, mainly because the two founders still own a, a strong single digit of this company. Uh, they are unwilling to dilute themselves, which I, which I like to see. They don't use debt. They don't dilute themselves. They are funding this business from its own free cash flow. And that is a rarity in this, in this landscape. And I like to see it. So that's saying, when I take free cash flow divided by share, this is the free cash flow per share that they get. And it's got from 13 all the way to 64, which is a monster, monster move. Share price recently has remained relatively flat. It's been in this $27 to $31 range for a long time, despite the growth in free cash flow that we're seeing. 48, excuse me, 28, 44, 61, and, uh, and 87. Strong growth here, kind of flat share, shares. I think that means that um, uh, the, the company's kind of accelerating, the shares aren't keeping pace, which is, which is neat. Last thing I've added based on a, a viewer's comment, I've added return on invested capital to our sheet. I haven't spent too much time on it to date, largely because it's been unimpressed by the, by the numbers I was seeing when I was looking at large cap companies. Uh, but this number here, above 20% every year for five years, uh, some of those numbers touching 30% are exceeding 30%, excuse me. That's outstanding. That means that the cash flow that they are generating they're putting back in the business and earning 30% return on their money is a, is a very nice, very strong number. Uh, and I think that bodes as to why they don't have to raise equity and why they're not taking on debt because the margins in the business are strong. They're reinvesting in markets that are growing and, and, and customers are responding by buying the, buying the mixer. Again, let me know if you've had this mixture, if you have it on your shelf right now, I'd love to have some just metadata from people just saying, hey, I've used it, I've tried it, I like it. What do you think? Is there another product that's better? Like maybe in our channel on this comment, if we get enough people chiming in that they've tasted it, who knows? Can we drive the market in this thing? I don't know. Go out and buy it. Buy the stock and then go in the store and everyone goes buy and buy out the shelves. You know, we'll see what happens. Forecasting. So what I've done as I've produced this, this is a little different from my normal forecast because I wanted to stick with top line revenue to give us an idea of where this is going to go. Um, but I want to do a revenue forecast. I'm going to play with the growth rate, play with the margin, and then give me an EBITDA, which I'll then roll into my forecast that I normally do. But revenue, revenue is going to fall 15%. And that's from the last uh, Q, the half report that I showed you has revenue off, t I think, 11% for the for H1 2020 versus H1 19. Uh, and uh, still holding at a pretty decent margin of 20%. So basically, a, a haircut revenue by 15%, I get this number, times 20% gives me a $57 million EBITDA forecast. I then kind of resume a growth rate, a strong growth rate that they've had in the past, reverting back, and I levelize it at about 20%. I'm hoping they can beat this number. Right? None of the numbers that we saw previously in their growth rate were, um, were this low. Everything was 30, 40, 50% growth annualized. I'm holding in the 20s and I'm bringing it down because I don't know what's going to happen. And I want this model to price itself under these scenarios. Hopefully they beat it. But if, but if I can justify an investment case with conservative numbers, I like that. Margin, I kept the same. EBITDA. Let's take this and roll it in get a price. Okay, so what I've done here is I've taken the EBITDA forecast I just showed you. I've laid it in here to give you a target of $483 million EBITDA target out in 10 years. It's basically a 10x increase in the EBITDA. I'm assigning that a 
30 times multiple because the growth rate is still double digits and it's still young, has a long room to run. That is a uh, $14 billion um, uh, enterprise value, which isn't that much larger than the $3 billion it's already, already at. I mean, it is. It's a good 4x, 4, 5x um, in, in size. But in terms of the scope of, of, of the beverage industry, the mixing industry, it's not that big. So I think it, it, it can handle it. I'm not changing shares. I'm assuming they don't dilute the shares and I get a $125 price target out in 10 years. Let's take a look at free cash flow. If I do the same uh, growth rate for free cash flow, remember no debt, low CapEx, EBITDA is gonna flow through the balance, excuse me, the cash flow statement like we saw, and it's gonna be here for distribution if, if warranted. Uh, this is this 51 cents is the average of the last three years, and I'm growing it the same way that I had before, and I get $2.75. I apply a 2% yield factor to that, and I get a price target of $137 a share. Now, we've got two forecasts for price. Let's go see what this looks like in terms of a value. The shares currently trade at $31 a share. We covered that earlier. They're kind of They've gone up and then down, kind of back up a little bit. So there's, they're in this range. Um, long term, however, if growth picks up, if margins stay the same, and you buy it and you hold it, and you and you and you you want to own this mixer company, um, long term, the price targets could achieve $130 a share if these numbers pan out. If that happens, that is a really big growth rate and a very strong IRR for an investment case. So what, what does that mean? I'm, I'm in for 30 bucks and change, I get a stream of cash flows, and then I'm out at $130, $131 a share. This is my net cash flow when I IRR this cash flow. That is a 20% annualized return every single year for, for 10 years. So that means every year, on average, you're making 20% of your money, and that results in almost a five times your money when you bought over that period of time, which is extremely strong. Um, and I, I, I'm hoping that there's even room to beat this number if revenue growth reverts back to the, um, uh, the historical 40, 50% growth rates that we have seen. Again, I'm, I'm holding it back because the, uh, the UK market was soft. That's got to that's gotta return. But the U.S. market was growing above my forecast. Europe was growing around the same forecast. And the rest of the world was above the forecast. So very interesting stock to check out. I'll give you the distribution pattern if for some reason it should, it should move. Again, $31 entry price, 20% IRR. As it goes up, I still think it's an interesting buy, but it's just not nearly as nice as it is now. If it should fall for some reason, it's extremely attractive. 24% annualized return is a monster, monster move. That's one of their 10 baggers in a decade kind of scenario if you get, you get a mid-20s IRRs. All right, let's recap Fever Tree for you and see what we think. Uh, top line revenue growth absolutely checks the box. Strong, strong double dip, digit growth. EBITDA, earnings, EBITDA checks the box. Strong EBITDA growth. Cash flow is very strong. Debt was zero, checks the box. Well priced, I think it is. Given what the growth curve could be and what this, this stock could perform as, paying 60 times a forward earnings is high, but given the cash flow that's going to come out of this in the future, I don't think it's too high. I think it's appropriate. So what we're going to do is we're going to give this a good rating uh, as a possible high growth stock that you can keep in your portfolio. Remember, it's over the counter. That means it's a pink sheet stock. That means there's very little volume. Uh, it's, it, it doesn't have a lot of liquidity. So if you buy it, you're going to have to hold on to it for a while and don't check it every single day. Buy it and forget about it. That's the way you got to hold something that's in a pink sheet stock. This has been uh, Rational Investing. My name is Cameron Stewart, CFA. Is, this, is, this is Fever Tree, the, um, uh, the, the cocktail mix company. Let me know what you think about this company, if I missed anything. And then what do you think about this micro, small cap venture uh, that we might go into? I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic in it. Personally, I think this is where I'm going to put the focus of my funds in 2021. 21, as I, I do think that the, the mega cap stocks 
are fully valued, are getting very rich, and it, it, I'm finding a hard time believing that the money that in there is is truly in there because they they've done the DCF, or it's really just everyone's in indexes, and indexes are forced to buy the companies that are in the index regardless of value. So I want to venture off the beaten path a little bit. I think that's what we're going to do. Let me know what you think. Hit the subscribe button. Hit the comments. Thank you very much. Talk to you later. Bye-bye.